Oh, sure. We'd all like to pretend that we'd be like Picard and have Shakespeare in the holodeck. But every one of us knows that we're an inner Beckett Mariner or Reginald Barkley waiting to happen. With that in mind, I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture. And here are Star Trek's 10 best holodeck episodes. Number 10, The Next Generation, A Fistful of Datas. Even in the future, there's a fascination with the past. That fascination led Deanna Troy and Worf to take his son Alexander on a holodeck adventure, set it in Deadwood, North Dakota, in the American Old West. This era is the Wild West at its wildest. Unbeknownst to the holodeck users, the Forge and Data were running experiments that directly interfaced Data with the ship's main computer. A power surge caused aspects of Data to overwrite aspects of the main computer. The end result was Data accidentally imprinting all over the Deadwood holodeck program. It started with the main villain, Frank Hollander, becoming Data. Like. He looked like Data, but maintained all of the Wild West mannerisms of Frank. Unfortunately, he also maintained all of Data's enhanced android abilities. Slowly, more and more characters became Data. Worf and Troy realized they had to complete the story to get out, which meant defeating all of the Datas. They were successful, but they still couldn't get out. Not until Worf received a kiss from his in-story love interest, who also looked like... Well, look, you get the point at this point. It was a fun, inventive episode, directed by Patrick Stewart, and it showed a much different side of Worf. Number 9. Deep Space Nine, bada bing, bada bang. Vic Fontaine is one of the most unique holographic characters in the history of Star Trek. Several episodes of Deep Space Nine in season 6 and 7 featured him, and they were always fun to watch. This one was no exception. Played by iconic crooner James Darren, Vic was a fictional 1960s lounge singer based out of Las Vegas. His program was designed for Julian Bashir, the station's doctor, to give him essentially a bar within a bar as the program was housed in one of Quark's holosuites. But what sets Vic apart is that he's sentient. He was 100% aware that he was a hologram in a holosuite program, and that there was an entire world going on outside that holosuite. Built into Vic's program was a hidden routine that caused a group of nefarious mobsters to take over Vic's. The space station crew had to band together to execute a complex Ocean's Eleven style heist to save him. Well, everyone except Cat and Sisko, who had little love for the program, mostly because of the era it was set in. Although, ultimately Sisko decided to help out and the DS9 crew saved the day. This led to a duet between Sisko and Vic, which was outstanding. For those who don't know, Avery Brooks is also an accomplished singer, so it really was a wonderful moment. 8. The Next Generation Elementary Dear Data Data was an incredible being to say the least, so challenging him often proved to be difficult. Geordie the Forge ran into this when he tried to put together a Sherlock Holmes themed mystery program for him to solve. The problem was that Data had every home story and research on the character in his memory. It was easy for him to just solve the program. Dr. Pulaski overheard the discussion and stated that she did not believe that Data was capable of solving a mystery that was 100% new and unfamiliar to him. Believing his friend was up to the challenge, Geordie instructed the computer to create a unique Sherlock Holmes mystery with a villain that might actually be be able to defeat Data. The unintended consequence was a holographic version of Professor Moriarty, who was self-aware and could access the Enterprise. Moriarty could actually call up a computer access terminal and utilize it. He was even able to cause damage to the Enterprise. Now, while they did get the program into storage, Moriarty was eventually released and caused more problems down the road. The Enterprise D had more than a few enemies, but having the holographic rendition of one of literature's greatest villains as one of your nemeses certainly stands out. Number 7. The Next Generation. The Big Goodbye. Captain Jean-Luc Picard has lots of hobbies. He loves to read, play music, and he's a big fan of archaeology. He's also super into Dixon Hill, a pulp detective holo program. Needing some relaxation while preparing for an important diplomatic greeting, Picard decides to indulge himself in a Dixon Hill mystery. Naturally, he played the role of Dixon Hill with Data, Dr. Whalen, and Dr. Crusher all joining him. Unfortunately, a scan from the species Picard would be meeting with caused havoc in many of the ship's systems. If you watch enough Star Trek, you'll find problems like that come up fairly frequently. The Enterprise crew found themselves trapped in the holodeck. They also found out the safety features were off the hard way when Dr. Whalen got shot and started bleeding out onto the ground. This just encouraged them to get out faster, which they needed help from the outside to do. It was interesting watching the normally reserved Picard cut loose in the holodeck and enjoy himself, which didn't happen often early on in the series. The episode had a much different tone from the others at this point and gave fans a much better look at the captain who was still quite new to them. Number 6. Deep Space Nine. Take me out to the holosuite. Now, I'm not going to lie, guys. I love this episode. Like Captain Picard, Captain Benjamin Sisko had his fair share of hobbies to help him deal with the stress of being in such an important role. Thanks to his father, Sisko had developed a healthy love of cooking. He was also an avid musician and singer, but his favourite pastime of all was 
baseball. Cisco even had several holodeck programs he took with him on every assignment to enjoy. Until the Vulcan showed up. Captain Solok was an old nemesis of Cisco's from his time in Starfleet Academy. Solok had also developed a fascination with baseball during his time on Earth, and now he had an all Vulcan team. He challenged Cisco to a game, which he immediately agreed to. Cisco tried to put a team together from his friends and crew, becoming a hard nosed captain and coach at the same time. In the end, Cisco's Motley team was absolutely destroyed by the precise and well trained Vulcans, but it did remind Cisco that the game was supposed to be fun. When they leaned into that, they were able to score one run. The final score was 10 to 1 for the Vulcans. Still, they celebrated a moral victory, which confused the hell out of Solok. It was a genuinely fun episode because it took so many of the characters fans were used to seeing out of their usual element and put them off balance. The decision to have the opposing team entirely made up of Vulcans was smart, simply because it's hard to imagine them playing a game of any kind, let alone baseball. Number 5. Deep Space Nine. Our man Bashir. Julian Bashir was absolutely fascinated with the idea of being a spy. This is part of the reason he was so quick to befriend Elam Garrick, the only Cardassian living on Deep Space Nine. Garrick claimed to be a simple tailor, but station rumours were that he was a former member of the Obsidian Order, the feared and secretive Cardassian intelligence department. Naturally, it was eventually confirmed to be true. Bashir was trying to relax in a Holosuite program where he played a secret agent in the 1960s. The tone of the program was comparable to the early James Bond movies with Sean Connery. Garrick busted in and and convinced Bashir to begrudgingly let him tag along. Unfortunately for Bashir, Garrick spent much of the story criticising it as unrealistic. Spies simply didn't act that way. At the same time, several members of the senior staff were caught in an incident on a sabotage ship that required an emergency escape via the transporter, which was also damaged. Their physical patterns ate up most of the station's memory, causing them to be placed in Bashir's programme and take over various in-game characters. The twist was that if the characters die in the programme, or the programme shuts down, Bashir and Garrick's friends would also die. They are forced to play through the story with more restraint until the rest of the crew are safe and they can get out. This episode is amazing simply to watch Avery Brooks play the part of an old school Bond villain, a role he excelled at. Number 4. Voyager, Bride of Chaotica the adventures of Captain Proton played a huge part on Voyager. The holodeck program was one of the main ways the stranded crew took their minds off their situation. The premise was quite obviously based on the 1930s serial Flash Gordon, a nod to one of science fiction's ancestors of Star Trek. Captain Proton and his sidekick Buster Kincaid were played by Tom Paris and Harry Kim, but one day they left the program running to attend to ship's business. While they were away, extra-dimensional beings showed up in the holodeck, thinking they were making first contact. Dr. Chaotica, the villain of the story, assumed they were enemies and attacked them, inciting a war. The only way to stop the battle was to engage the story. Paris and Kim played their usual parts, joined by the holographic doctor as the president of Earth. While she eventually relented, Captain Janeway initially fought back against playing the role of Queen Arachnia. Chaotica's Bride. Essentially, she didn't like the implication of the casting. It is an incredibly fun episode that benefited greatly from the old school science fiction vibes. More than that, it made the story within the story relevant to what was going on on the rest of the ship. First Contact happens frequently on Star Trek programs, but it rarely plays out as part of a war with holodeck characters. Number 3. Deep Space Nine, It's Only a Paper Moon. The primary role of holodecks in Star Trek is entertainment, but sometimes they become something much more important than that. After losing his leg in battle, Nog had to have it replaced. This was followed by months of rehabilitation away from the station. Upon his return, Nog was met with open arms, but seemed to be removed. Unsurprisingly, given the situation, he was suffering from both post-traumatic stress disorder and phantom pain from the loss of his leg. Nothing seemed to pull him out of his state until he went to Vix in one of the holosuites. Under the direction of Esri Dax, Nog used Vix as a means of therapy as he had to adjust to this new normal. The problem was Nog disappeared into the fictional world of Vix fully and completely. It got to the point where he rarely left, hiding in the holosuite from reality. Vic exerted his impressive control by shutting down his own program and not allowing Nog to restart it. The move forced Nog progress into the next stage of his recovery process, which ended up working. The episode was important for two reasons. First, War and combat come frequently in the Star Trek series, but not the fallout from it. Discussing PTSD and phantom pain brought in some of the horrifying aftermath of battle in the fictional world. The second key element was the long-term impact on the series. As a thank you for helping his nephew, Quark decided to dedicate one of his holosuites to Vic and leave it running full time. Number 2. The Next Generation Hollow Pursuits Thanks to the existence of holodecks in Star Trek, holodeck addiction became an issue that needed to be dealt with. One of the most prominent sufferers of this illness was Reginald Barkley, a crew member on the Enterprise D and a talented engineer working under Geordi LaForge. Though he had been on the Enterprise for a while, this episode was the first one Barkley appeared in. It 
did not go well at first. Barclay's addiction to the holodeck crippled him at every turn. He was unfocused, unreliable and constantly late. In the real world, he was a nervous man who was intimidated by everyone. In the holodeck, he was the man. Barclay created a world in the holodeck that utilised in the people he encountered and almost feared on a daily basis. He used the likenesses of everyone around him, including Riker, Troy and, often in exaggerated and insulting ways. It was a huge no-no that almost got him relieved of duty, but his friends stepped in and helped him to beat his addiction, making him a more valuable member of the team. What was interesting about this examination of addiction was how it was portrayed and why it was being used. Barclay suffered from crippling anxiety issues and could only really represent the person he really wanted to be while in a holographic scenario. It came down to his crewmates and friends to help him realise that he was just as valuable in the real world as he was in this holodeck recreation as well. The final line of the episode, computer, delete all programs, mm, except for that one, is both a wink to the camera, a recognition of Barclay's growth, and also a possible tease for a future relapse. Number 1. Voyager – Real Life When the USS Voyager was stranded in the Delta Quadrant, they suffered a range of problems and losses right off the bat. One of them was the death of the ship's doctor and his staff. The crew of the Voyager was left with the Emergency Medical Holographic Mark I program to take care of them. The doctor was not meant for the level of usage he got, but he learned, adapted and proved to be more than up to the challenge. One of the ways the doctor tried to grow was by creating a holographic family. He felt that this was necessary to understand the human experience better and improve as a physician. His family consisted of his wife Charlene, his son Jeffrey, and his daughter Belle. But once crew members started to meet them, they pointed out that his family was impossibly perfect and his experience was not real. Belana Torres offered to program some more difficulties into his family. She was, to put it mildly, extremely successful. The new iteration of the Doctor's family was far more dysfunctional. Charlene was more removed and distant. Jeffrey was involved with a rough element. <coughs> <clears throat> Klingons. Bell wanted to get involved in dangerous sports like Parisi Squares. The end result of all of this was Bell being critically injured and at death's door. Rather than facing this, the doctor walked away from the program until Paris convinced him to go back and see it through. It was a painful experience for the doctor, as it would be for anyone. Giving an artificial life form a truly human moment is a hallmark of Star Trek. This tragic moment played out all too realistically and made this one of the most engaging episodes of the series. Now that's it for our list today. What do you reckon? Did we miss any? If you think we did, drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick as well. Look after yourself, whether you're on the holodeck, whether you're in the real world, whatever you're doing, make sure you're okay. Make sure your friends and family are okay and you live long and prosper.